Matt and Ryan here again, Expedition 44. We started the Book of Colossians last week, Matt. We did an introduction to it, kind of briefly recap what we talked about. Um, so we kind of defended uh, Paul's authorship of the book. Um, we showed um, some evidence that was written in the probably the mid to late 50s um, AD. Um, we looked at the occasion, the Colossian heresy. So we saw it was kind of a, this melting pot of Eastern mystical thought, um, Western like Greek Stoicism and Judaism kind of all in the middle, all, all mixed up, all mixed up pot, together. Yeah. yeah, so we see a lot of Jewish elements in it and we see that these people are looking at things very spiritually, a worship of angels, things yeah. like that. And it might be that these are mystical Jews. So right. you have to follow the law to be able to have these mystical experiences. So yeah. that's kind of what we what we got. Very relevant book to today's culture. I think, mm -hmm. you know, it's been said many times it's the most relevant book. And uh, so we talked through that. We got into a little argument along the way. Yeah. <laughs> Paul's imprisonment. <laughs> so today we are going to start out with Colossians 1. Mm -hmm. And... You and I refer to what I would call a Deuteronomy 32, D32 worldview mm -hmm. regularly. And there's really, when you're reading Colossians, either you have this view or you don't. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a different book, the way you interpret it yeah. between those two lenses. And both, both you and I strongly take the Deuteronomy 32 worldview in this book. So let's explain what that looks like within the context of Colossians. Yeah, we're, the first thing that really we hit on in class this week was um, the word saints, yes. or holy ones, hagios yeah. in Greek. And pe people think that when you say saints in the Bible, that it refers to people that have lived their life worthy of the calling. That's mm -hmm. when you talk to anybody in church, that's what they think of. But you and I don't really go that way. No, um, really, if you look at that, that word hagios in the Septuagint, so the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that was made a few hundred years before Jesus, you find that about 20 so times in the Old Testament. It pretty much always means holy ones as spiritual beings, yeah. except for only one time in the yeah. book of Daniel. And, and it's very predominant in Old Testament and in Second Temple thinking. Like they, whenever they talked about it, you'd be hard pressed to find any example where in Second Temple thinking they would have mm -hmm. thought that meant people. Yep. Yeah. What else? How, how does it kind of connect to Colossians? So when we're looking at holy ones as spiritual beings, and if Paul is calling the church in Colossae a holy one. Yeah. It's kind of this connection of um, the people, like the holy ones were the ones who served in God's presence. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's calling these the church, the body of Christ, as holy ones, connecting the God's spiritual family and physical family together. So this book is kind of linking the cosmos almost. Mm -hmm. It's it's taking this yeah. Old Testament view of the divinity, the spiritual ones, and it's kind of making a bridge to believers. Mm -hmm. and. That flushes out in ideas of inheritance and the church, like you said. Yeah. Keep going with this. So we see um, in verse 12, we see holy ones in light. It connects yeah. inheritance and holy ones in light. And we talk about holy ones, spiritual beings. And in in, in light, it's kind of interesting because in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the War Scroll, yes. they connect the sons of light, which are God's kind of end times family. Yeah, which is a little play on Expedition 44, 44 by yeah, the way. Yeah. 44 was the number, right. that the numerology that they yeah. gave to these this group in Qumran. Yep. So inheritance, we see in Deuteronomy at 32 verse 8 um, that God gave the nations their inheritance. Yes. So when he divided them up a Babel and put a, a holy one, a Elohim, spiritual being, kind of to rule over each one, but they all kind of led these nations astray. Yeah, yeah. So we see that. And we also see in, in this kind of this picture in Psalm 89, 5 to 7, that the holy ones are in God's assembly. And that word assembly is ecclesia, the same word for church. The church, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So yeah. we're connecting these dots here. Of, okay, holy ones, spiritual beings, the church, and the church in Colossae, kind of all this view of, of inheritance. And so, Ryan, in the one, the, like we talked about the Septuagint being translated um the greek translation yeah. of the hebrew bible we see this word inheritance often always in the old testament doesn't really mean salvation right. which what we talk of we think of our inheritances in heaven or something yeah. like that but this actually means physical stuff a people yeah. a land a kingdom yes so that's tangible yeah tangible yeah. stuff so this and there's is, there's a relation to sacred space here too that mm -hmm. you kind of have to get and the first time i mean this kind of blew people away in our class when you were going through mm -hmm. this because just our ingrained concept of Colossians, we've never read it this way. Then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you start reading it this way. And like I said, it's like a new book. Yeah. And so really if it's talking about physical stuff and if 
Paul is dealing with this dualistic mentality yes. of the flesh being bad and the spiritual being good. This is really just a poke in the eye at these people saying that, hey, this inheritance, the kleros, right. the word in Greek there, which is connects to physical inheritance, yeah. that it's not you're escaping this body and your soul going to heaven yep. is the final destiny, that it's a physical yeah. inheritance. And that flushes into the kingdom talk in mm -hmm. here. And so we have the kingdom, and then it talks about a domain of darkness. How do those fit into that same picture? Yeah, so we kind of titled this in our class the New Exodus. Yeah. So they uses words from the Exodus, like redemption mm -hmm. in Exodus 6 6. Yep. Um, so we got God's kingdom. So this present kingdom that we're transferred there is in aorist tense. Yep. So aorist tense in Greek is a snapshot of something that has already taken place. It's completed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we see that uh, a lot of people just when they think of kingdom, they think of like what the thousand year yes. reign, the millennial reign of Christ that we see in Revelation. Um, but this is saying the kingdom's here and yeah. the Colossian church is part of that yes. that kingdom. They've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness. Yeah. So Ryan, um, kingdom of, or the domain of darkness in the Old Testament, what, what, do, we, what do we see there? How is it described? So first, there's this idea of it's kind of already not yet. Mm -hmm. We hear that in, in terms of theology and people don't quite understand that. Where does that come from? Yeah, so we see here, like, the kingdom is kind of reality based on the Greek grammar. Yeah. But you see, like, in 1 Corinthians 15, the kingdom will be handed over to the Father. It's still yeah. something future yep. that hasn't happened yet, something that will happen at Christ's return. So it's already a reality of something yep. that we live in, but it's something that's broken into the present but hasn't fully yeah. been consummated. That's a good way to say it. And that's yep. the, the reference there is 1 Corinthians 15 that kind of ties yep. it all in together. Mm -hmm. So. So now, when we're talking and we're linking this to the, the new exodus, there's this kind of idea of cosmic geography. And mm -hmm. where that starts is everything's outside of Yahweh's sacred space. So I always like to say it starts with Eden and it ends with Eden. So mm -hmm. we have this picture of Eden, of that is God's sacred space, the temple, the high mountain area, things like that. And then we lose that. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of disappears or goes away someplace. And in the end, that's where it comes back to. That's where it finishes. And so kind of putting this all together, there's, there's a domain of darkness that ties into kind of this whole era between the two Edens, so to speak. And it's really linked to the, the picture of, of this love story book and in Deuteronomy 32, again, really plays into this, of, of God is coming up with kind of a plan to reassess of how to bring back Eden after we and the spiritual, uh, the spiritual entity screwed it up so much. Yep. And so God doesn't just give up on it. He yep. says, I still have a plan to bring this back despite all of the ways that this has kind of gone aside. And so that plan is kind of rooted in Israel in the Old Testament, and it flushes out in the Day of Atonement. You might have heard of the Azazel, the, the, the one goat is, is kind of given as a sacrifice of, of almost reconciliation at yep. the point, and then the Azazel is sent away into the wilderness to kind of be pushed out, and it's, it's a picture of really what God is doing with Israel, but then later even with the nations. It all, all ties in, and this one is a kind of detailed study. So we can't get too into mm -hmm. it right now, but when we read about the domain of darkness in Colossians, that's what it's referring to. It's taking yeah. in and building all of that. Yep. Yeah, so we have redemption, being set free from slavery. So we have this picture of us being slaves in the domain of darkness. Yeah. Jesus coming in and rescuing us out of there like the Exodus. Yes. God coming in and rescuing Israel out of Egypt. God, Jesus coming in and rescuing us from death. It's all tied mm -hmm. to atonement again, yep. going back to the same thing. And, you know, some people kind of call that as a, a ransom theory. And, you know, I don't want to get stuck on the ransom yeah. theory because I think sometimes theologians you know, think that if you are going to use these words, you have to totally buy into mm -hmm. every little piece of it. And in mm -hmm. Colossians, we see a lot of theological terms where, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of tend to find yourself halfway in the middle sometimes, you know, do you have to be a ransom theologian to understand what's going on here? No, because I mean, I love what kind of Scott McKnight does with um, atonement theories. He yeah. says they're uh, basically, he takes a kaleidoscope view. They're each a club in a bag. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you can use them to, in different situations to depict different angles of what the cross accomplished. That's exactly what we see here. Yeah. So I don't even really like the to use the words because mm -hmm. as I identify with some of it in there, some mm -hmm. of it, yeah, it's, it's a golf club, like yep. I said. Yep. Yeah, Use right. a different club for a different shot. <laughs> now, moral wrongs, forgiveness of sins, What's the Jewish mindset here, and maybe even like the Stoic mindset or the mystic mindset? Mm -hmm. Where, what's it playing on here? So 
in Judaism, we see quite a bit, especially like in the book of Ezekiel, that the forgiveness of sins that they're looking forward to is a return from exile. Yes. So it's not so much, I mean, yeah, they did moral things that put them there. And so it's a, it's a covering of those moral and um, a reconciliation of redemption. So being brought back into the land and restored to the inheritance that they once had. Yeah. So it's cosmic order being set mm -hmm. right back in place. Yeah, it had less to do because of the ancient mindset wasn't as... It's individualized and didn't focus so much on individual rights and wrongs and yeah. that type of stuff where it was community based. Yeah. So God's taking his mm -hmm. people and bringing them out of exile and restoring the cosmic yeah. order. Yeah. So yeah. In the Gentile case, we kind of see if we look at the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, the re-inheriting of the nations yes. being grafted back into Israel, yeah. into that inheritance that... And we're going to come back around yep, to, to that, that here in a minute. Chapter, so yeah. yeah. So. So, so in the middle of Colossians, it kind of starts around verse 15, we get this thing that's kind of called a Christ hymn or a wisdom tradition. Mm -hmm. People have, that know Colossians and read the Bible for their whole life may have never heard it put that way. What, what is, why do we call it that? Yeah, so in uh, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, we kind of have this, it seems like it's almost a hymn. Um, yeah. And this is part of the reasons that we were talking about that people really some doubt Paul's yeah. um, authorship yep. because it's got such a high view of, of Christ. But he's doing this for a purpose because yeah. of the audience that he's against. He's putting Christ above yes. the spiritual beings. In this, it's not that it doesn't fit. I mean, it does fit mm -hmm. into the whole context of it, but but it almost seems like it's like a letter within a letter or mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah. he was writing this and thought, you know, this really fits in well to where I'm going with it. So what what is it? So maybe it was part of ancient church liturgy or something that was yeah. already going around, a song that was be, already yeah. popular at the time that he stuck in here as a quotation, yes. or maybe he wrote it himself. Right. So those are some options that we can deal with here. But it really deals with the, the wisdom tradition. Um, if you look at uh, Proverbs 8, we see in the beginning that wisdom was with God when he created the universe. Yes. So, and what Paul is doing, he's putting Jesus in the God spot in the wisdom spot there. Yeah. Kind of, we talked last week about kind of the binatarian view that ancient Jews had a visible and invisible Yahweh, and the spirit was there too. Yeah. Um, but really, they kind of focused on on those. Conceptually, two. they thought that way. Trinitarian views didn't come till much later. Yeah. That, so that was yeah. kind of ancient Jewish way of of thinking. So we have. Yeah, he's looking at Proverbs 8 through the view or the lens of Genesis 1. Yeah. And we touched on this in Job too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Job had some of these same mindsets. Mm -hmm. And really, you could find this, this the wisdom principles in just mm -hmm. about any Old Testament literature, mm -hmm. but partip, par particularly the more poetic ones, I would say. Yeah, um, Wisdom of Solomon is a huge one that puts, um, that's an intertestamental book. Yeah. And basically, you can find all these phrases that he uses here in verses 15 to 20 in the wisdom of Solomon, connecting wisdom to creation. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we got Paul also in 1 Corinthians one twenty four saying that Jesus is the wisdom of God. Yep. Uh, we have John chapter 1 saying in the beginning was the word, that word logos there, is actually one of the Greek words for wisdom. Yeah. It was in rhetorical um, speeches, they used this format called logos, which yep. was appealing to logic and wisdom. Yeah, and then there's like a Luke 11 and Matthew 23 yeah. correlation mm -hmm. on there too. What is what is that kind of so saying or reiterating? Luke, Luke 11 says that God sent his wisdom um, through the prophets um, to to communicate yeah. um, and yet to kill the prophets. Right. And then Jesus says then in Matthew in the um, parallel to this that I yeah. sense it. So this is a shivers down your spine mm -hmm. moment when you make this connection. Yeah, so Matthew 23, 34, Jesus saying that he is God's wisdom that came. Yeah, yeah. And How do we miss that? I mean, so many people, like, they, they go through this and they've never even heard this. I mean, I've even had, like, pastors, like, hear those words and go, yeah, tell me more about that. You know, it's like it just completely goes over mm -hmm. people's heads. Yeah, and if you read Hebrews chapter 1, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews does the exact same thing with Jesus and wisdom, connecting, yeah. connecting that, yeah. putting Jesus in the wisdom spot. And wisdom is in the God spot. So what yeah. Paul is doing is he's not saying that Jesus is like one of all these other spiritual beings, which is kind of in the water here in Colossae, he's saying yeah. that he is the actual creator. Yeah. He is equal with God. Yep. 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 Pretty neat. Yep. So then, then from there, there's some firstborn terminology. Yeah. This is where people get hung up because it kind of, if we're thinking chronology here, like I'm the oldest of four kids. Yeah. Um, so I'm the, I'm the firstborn. Right. Um, it, and I was, Created by my parents. So right. does this mean that Jesus was, was the very first. first 
um, created by That's God. That's what most people think. That's what most people think. But I mean, you kind of look at Exodus 4.22 and we see Israel being called God's firstborn. Yep. Um, they weren't the first people. No. No. <laughs> and So it's not chrono- chronological. Yeah. I mean, if you look at it that way, your theology would be pretty skewed. Like mm-hmm. you really can't take that view because it gets very problematic. And yeah. so... Psalm 89, you got the Davidic kingship being linked to firstborn and that yep. David wasn't Israel's first king and he wasn't the first human either. Yep. So it, it's about kingship yes. and status yes. is what That's firstborn is. That's the connection. Is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so then you have this visible, invisible, all things kind of connected at the hip, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, what about... There, there's first. There's a connection of the resurrection with yeah, this too. first born of the dead. Yeah, that they're tied in, and people mm-hmm. again. That's one of those concepts people don't really know what to do with the first born of the dead because that kind of plays into your concept of the afterlife too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we kind of see this disembodied spirit going to the heaven view. We see it a lot in the church, but especially kind of in Eastern thought, in even in Stoicism, where they saw the physical as bad, yeah. and that's kind of where they originated with Plato, this immaterial yeah. soul. Yeah. And that's why we have such a skewed concept of soul. We talked mm-hmm. about that in the Nafish video and some other times is, you know, Americans think this idea of soul and it's that our idea of soul isn't really biblical. That's not what no. it was described. Yeah. It's the combination of everything that you are. Yeah. The, the deepest part of who you are is yeah. your suke or nefesh. Yeah. So. And so when you talk about like the first fruits of the dead and how this clutches mm-hmm. in, it's going to have an effect on your end game thinking here. Yep. Yeah. So then we have a little bit of a hang up in the fullness of Christ, because that's where this really flushes out. And you got to kind of look a little bit at the Greek wording here to get a really good understanding. So walk us through that a little bit. So the word pleroma is the word for fullness. And that this that's this is one of the points that they really think that Paul is dealing with Gnosticism, because yeah. that became like a trigger word in yeah. Gnosticism much later. Yeah. And that's part of the reason that some people will put it later, but we've shown that this word doesn't necessarily have to mean that because yeah. it could also be instead of taking a Gnostic or um, Eastern view of the word, it could take a Jewish view of the word. Yeah. So, which I think would be more suited in Paul's mind being yeah. a Pharisee, where the fullness was God's presence filling the temple. Yeah. And then Solomon even saying that the temple can't contain you and you, you are, your fullness fills the entire earth and the entire cosmos. So we get this theologically when we say that Jesus is all we need, mm-hmm. that there's nothing else. But, mm-hmm. but, but the fullness, and, and I think where this ties in is that it connects a lot of dots here that I think... Theologically, when even when we say that, I kind of laugh when I hear people say that because I don't think they're really understanding the implications of what's yeah. all tied into saying that. But it's nothing lacking, everything, and it's funny how we're how theologians across the board are so easy to say that. Yet all of a sudden, when you kind of explain the implications, they're almost like, "Well, hold on, I'm yeah. not sure I want to go there," you know? Yeah. yeah. And then, then in that, all things are reconciled, and again. We have no problem saying that about Jesus, no matter what theology mm-hmm. you maintain, but it really kind of gets into it here. And do you want to get into that? I mean, do we have 45 minutes to really dive into the language and everything else? Maybe we'll make maybe a second video just on this verse because we could take an hour just yeah. talking about this little section of, of verse 20. And there's some pretty good stuff out there already on the internet that really scholarly goes into it, but you got to you got to want to jump into this because yeah, it gets it, hardy. Yeah, it does. Um, I would recommend uh, Michael Heiser's The Naked Bible Podcast. He did a series on Colossians. I think it's a se- second episode yeah. or third episode where he really gets into this on that. So um, I recommend that to you if you want to kind of dig into this. Maybe we'll make a video later. So yeah. let's just give him our conclusion on All that, right. Ryan. Sounds good. So we take reconciliation not as individual salvation here yeah. because then that would kind of point to a bit of universalism yep. or reconciliation of um, basically fallen spiritual beings, yeah. which we don't see that in the beginning of Revelation, and we don't see the spiritual being thing. Um, if you look at Hebrews chapter 2, there's some stuff that points against that. So if you don't know what we're even talking about right now, uh-huh. it's basically the idea is that these spiritual beings, a horrible way to say this is angels, what happens to them mm-hmm. kind of and it's funny that people would say the afterlife. Yeah. We laugh at that all the time, yeah. but, but what 
what's the reconciliation within angels? And that's what this is kind of playing into. Yeah, some people take it that way. We take it, and the Greek grammar supports this without going too crazy into it, that it's a reconciliation of the cosmos. So if yeah. we see Eden was where heaven and earth overlapped at the beginning, and because of Adam's sin and the fall of the spiritual beings as well, um, heaven and earth were ripped apart. Yes. And yeah. so this is Jesus through his death and through his defeating of the powers is reconciliating and reconciling heaven and earth together. Um, it's an already not yet thing again. Yeah. So, but now they're overlapping again. So the way of seeing this is connecting the scriptures that mm -hmm. way. And in Colossians, people almost want to go with like the, the, separations that their Bible puts in there mm -hmm. and, you know, end and begin at these things, which we just know is not a good way to read our whole Bible yeah. in general. But when we're looking at this and you read it together, those, those verses are connected and it's hard to see another view when you read it that way. Yep. Yeah. Um, so Colossians 1 16, Colossians 1 20, Colossians 2 15, they're understood together. Yeah, they should be. It's, um, it's really important to see the reconciliation and the defeating of the powers um, at the same time, because that was that's the key to seeing this heaven earth overlap the reconciliation of of sacred space with yeah. with the physical space. So. And this isn't the only place that you see this in the Bible. I think I think once you get this mindset, you see it a lot. But Hebrews two is another place that mm -hmm. you know you, you read it, and theologically, it would be very difficult to read that a different way. Again. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. All right. So from here, we kind of get towards the end of Colossians and. We bring this back to reconciliation on a bigger plane. Yeah. What 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 is that bigger plane? So looking at the so we see the cosmos being reconciled, and he then zooms in on the nations. So we see kind of Israel being God's people, nations being disinherited through Jesus, the nations being reinherited. We we see at what at Babel, which basically what Moses is retelling that story in Deuteronomy thirty two eight yep. there. Um, when you look at Genesis 10, um, the table of nations there, and then if you look at Acts chapter 2, yeah. where you have Pentecost going on and um, the different um, Jews and proselytes coming in for the Feast of Pentecost, which was a pilgrimage yep. festival, and then the outpouring of the Spirit, the locations where these people came from and the division of the nations overlap. It's like Jesus is commissioning them yes. to go regather the nations again. It's another shiver down your spine moment. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of referred to as the table of nations. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it's it's so powerful yeah. when you look at it. And then Acts way. chapter 2 is depicting the reverse of that and the re-inheriting yeah. of, of the Gentiles. Yeah. So again, if you're having a hard time following that Deuteronomy 32 film we made is kind of a precursor of this video. You kind of have to watch it. But, but to put this in simple terms, um, as Matt described this process, um, God's going to say, this is my portion of Israel. I'm going to focus on this. And then he gives the other portions to spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. They basically fall. The nations go into a, utter chaos um, against God, really, mm -hmm. along with their spiritual beings. Yeah. And, you know, the, the second temple people would look at that and they would say it was just a mess, you know, and, and it wasn't really what God was probably planning to happen, but man and the spiritual fallen beings made this happen. And while God is focusing on Israel as his chosen people, he hasn't forgot about the nations. And this is where it really makes sense to hold this view when you go back into the Old Testament and you say, was God only providing we'll call it salvation, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, the Israelites. What about the rest of the nations at this point? Because when you read the Old Testament, especially if you're reading about the Canaanites, it looks yeah. like God wants nothing to do with those people. Yeah, you do see some people, even in the um, basically the genealogy of Jesus, that yeah. were from outside of Israel in there. You got Ruth, you got Rahab. Yeah. You got, so you, there was opportunity for people outside of God's people to come in. And there actually might even be more opportunity than we give merit to, and we don't have time to get into this one, but there's a huge contention of what happens to all these people. Are they possibly given a second chance that's connected with the cross? Yep. And so there's that thinking, but the idea is that eventually these nations are going to be welcomed back in, gone after, mm -hmm you know, reconciled is the word that we would use. And so how do we go about doing that? Is that done through the Jewish nation? Is that done through the church as could be worked out through Colossians? Does the church become that? There's some, there's some significant ideas here. And in theology, we have some words for this. And again, Matt and I don't really like to 
put ourselves within the confines of these words because, like he mm -hmm. explained earlier, they kind of jump back and forth. But when you're looking at that, how do we explain those different ideas? So we have one view, which is called replacement theology. So the church replaced Israel yeah. after the cross. Yeah. So God was done with Israel and now he's working with the church. Yeah. And then the next one is uh, covenant, covenant theology. theology. Yeah. So the church is kind of grafted into the covenants of Israel. Yeah. So they both exist um, in kind of as Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, you, you who were once outside now become part of the commonwealth of Israel and part of the covenants. Yeah. And then we get to the last one, and I think most people have kind of a pre-millennial view yeah, dispensation. of yeah, of rapture, and then then you you kind of call that dispensation like you just mm -hmm. said, and then people get hung up on that one. They're like, oh, hold on a minute. Yeah, you know? they see Israel and the church as two distinct groups, and God works with them differently. Yeah. So now we kind of have when we when we start getting into these millennialism conversations, you and I kind of almost yeah. have a hang up <laughs> yeah. there, and we we might come back, back to, to that. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we see um, here that what the Gentiles are being reconciled and invited back in. So we see kind of like you and I, we land um, probably closer to covenant. Yeah. Especially um, me, because I'm an Old Testament guy yeah. and everything's covenantal that way. So. And I can see it even with Paul being the um, Romans chapters uh, 9 to 11, yeah. the Gentiles being grafted in as unnatural branches into the natural root yeah. of the tree there. Um, so it kind of paints this picture of them being put into that Abrahamic yeah. covenant, which was to all the nations. Like the, yeah. the, he would have a family. Yeah. Um, is and Paul was a big Old Testament guy. Oh yeah. You know? I mean, you you look at this, and people again miss this disconnect all the time. That you know, when he's speaking, we kind of like put his words as oh, that's New Testament thinking. But actually, mm -hmm. he was the biggest proponent of Old Testament thinking. Yeah, and he sees that these covenants being fulfilled by Jesus. Um, and also being played out in the church yeah. as when we talk about the holy ones, one people of, yes. of God. Yeah. So not really too distinct. It's like a proclamation to mm -hmm. all of creation. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. And so really we, when we look at what was the purpose of Israel, it wasn't just God saving one people. It was the, him giving them a job to gather in the nations yet they failed at it. Yeah. But one guy, yep. Jesus. Yep. And there, that, there's yeah, a celestial tie there mm -hmm. too, where yep. it kind of comes back to those objects pulling them in together mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yep. Now, there's a little bit of a, a word here that's a mystery. Mm -hmm. where, where that's kind of the way the chapter kind of finishes up. And it is connected, but people often don't make the connection. Where, where do we land there? Yeah, so it says the mystery that was hidden is now revealed. Yeah. So this mystery, I mean, we see that really, if you look at the Old Testament, all the dots aren't really connected that point to Jesus. And when right. Jesus comes, we can connect the dots. Yeah, it goes all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant. covenant. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we see that through Jesus and his defeating of the powers that were over these nations allows the, the nations to come back yeah. as one family of God. And this is what we were alluding to is, is somehow, you know, what the implications here would actually cover the people in the Old Testament from the disinherited nations. Mm -hmm. And so you, you can't really land here without getting to that idea that they're included in here too. And we don't totally know how that works within the context of scripture. It's one of those mm -hmm. theological mysteries, I'm going yeah. to say. And so it very, there's a lot of word plays in the Bible. And I firmly believe that this was one that Paul knew exactly what he was saying here and was kind of alluding to that reference to us. Yeah. yeah. So, is there anything lacking in Christ's suffering? That's an interesting question. That's um, one of the verses here. He says that he's filling, filling up in his own body. Paul is through yeah. sharing the gospel and suffering for it. What Christ lacked in his suffering. Yeah. So that that's kind of kind of interesting. But if you look at Romans eight seventeen, um, Philippians three ten, it it shows that we're part of the body of of Christ, yes. and we are. And we show that by co-suffering yeah. with Christ. So it's not that he's filling up anything that Christ is really, Christ didn't accomplish. Right. He's not adding to what Christ did. Right. But as part of his corporate body, and one of Paul's favorite words to talk about Christians is in Christ. Yep. So it's this union. So we're united. Um, some people call this glorification or theosis, yep. as fancy theological words. But it's by participating in, in Christ, yeah, we're going to, we should expect suffering. So if there is anything lacking in Christ, it would be you and I yep. are lacking in yep. Christ. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> 
Is that it? Is that the chapter? That's pretty much it. Next week we're going to jump into chapter two, and there's a there's a lot to uh, in there, so it's going to be once again like drinking from a fire hose. Fire hose. <laughs> so, fire hose theology. Yeah. We're going to have to brand that one. Yeah. yeah. So hope you guys enjoyed the study, Matt. Thanks for taking yeah. us on this guided tour today. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and tune in next week for Colossians two. May God bless you and keep you.